One of the most intriguing mysteries in the field of modern UFO research can be found not in the sky or in outer space, but in the Nevada desert, in a region identified on the maps only as Area 51. There, in the vicinity of the dry bed of Groom Lake, this complex reportedly operates day and night, seen by countless witnesses and photographed time and again. And if the rumors about it are true, this installation is the hiding place of one of the most amazing secret projects of this or any other century. And clearly there are secrets of some kind in this mysterious complex, because according to official government maps of the region, the entire installation simply does not exist. Why is this desert base such a secret? Is the truth about its purpose related to the continual sightings in the area of UFOs? After the Lazar story broke, the UFO watchers came here and discovered this land. They came here in four-wheel drives to, to overlook this secret base. In a recent interview, Robert Lazar claimed he was employed between 1988 and 1989 as a research specialist at a hidden base even more secret than the Groom Lake installation. When I went to work, I was flown from McCarran Airport in Las Vegas to Area 51. From Area 51, I was bused to an even more highly secure facility located about 15 miles south of Area 51 called S4. S4 is situated at the base of the Papoose Mountains by the Papoose Dry Lake Bed. The S4 installation is built into the mountain and the nine hangar doors are angled at about 60 degrees. These doors are covered with a sand textured coating to blend in with the side of the mountain and the desert floor. According to Bob Lazar, it was in this hidden base that he worked on disc-shaped flying craft that were based on technology given to mankind by beings from another planet. Not only did I read briefings and not only was I taught the theories of these technologies, but they were demonstrated for me and I know they are true and accurate. Lazar went on to claim that there are several fully working flying discs at the S-4 facility, but only one on which he personally worked because of its sleek appearance, I nicknamed it the Sport Model. The Sport Model is about 16 feet tall and 40 feet in diameter. The center level of this disc also houses the control consoles and seats, both of which were too small and too low to the floor to be functional for adult human beings. If the story Lazar tells is true, then this design is no mere fantasy, but a reality, and proof positive that Earth has been visited by intelligent beings from another planet. Could the U.S. government actually have one or more UFOs in their possession and kept such a secret from the public and the press for almost 50 years? And if the story has already been told, why is the government still taking such extraordinary measures to try and keep the base hidden? According to this research by the Salt Lake Tribune in September of 1993, Air Force Secretary Sheila Widnall requested control over nearly 4,000 acres of publicly owned land out in the Nevada desert in the Nellis Range Complex. Glenn Campbell has dedicated the last few years to breaking the wall of secrecy around Area 51 and the mysterious base at Groom Lake. Area 51 is a small block of land that is simply the best known of the secret areas of the Nellis Air Force Range Complex. Behind that, we have vast areas of desert. Until the early 1980s, it was actually possible to drive up to the Groom Dry Lake Bed and look across and see the base in the distance. It was a secret base, but an open secret. In the mid-1980s, the military seized an entire mountain range, the Groom Mountain Range, to keep Soviet spies from looking down on this base. At that point, the base became non-existent. It disappeared from USGS maps, and ever since then, the, the government has refused to refer to the base in any manner or form. What could be on this installation that would merit such strong measures? Does anyone outside of the base really know what kind of work is being done there? We should all remember that the U-2 spy plane was flying out of Area 51 for many years. The same is true of the Blackbird SR-71 and the stealth fighter. They were all flying for many years before we heard about them. But will the government use deadly force to keep citizens from simply seeing airplanes take off and land? It has, uh, I'm told, surface-to-air missiles in case planes fly over that aren't welcome there. We were pursued uh, dangerously by this helicopter. Another airplane will be scrambled to intercept him and force him out of the area, or he'll be shot down. Can security measures be taken too far? And what happens when one side or the other crosses the line? 
We'll find out when UFO Diaries returns. Whatever may be happening at Area 51, it seems certain that the high security is not to keep people from wandering into some area where they could be hurt. It is designed specifically to protect whoever or whatever is inside the complex at Groom Lake. What's going on here? I'm sorry, the road's blocked. Let's move it on, please. Isn't this public land? Uh, could you please move on? They're prepared to use whatever force necessary to keep the people as far away as possible from this area. Norio Hayakawa says he has witnessed firsthand the aggressive security measures at Area 51. In 1991, I led an investigative group from Southern California, including some journalists, uh, to this area. And uh, after we witnessed the what I believe was some type of a test flight or possibly a maneuvering of these uh, objects, I was leading a caravan of seven cars on this uh, dirt road. Suddenly, a black military helicopter with no insignia uh, came over and approached our cars, came in front of our, our cars, almost about uh, 10 to 15 feet above our cars. But if Norio Hayakawa and other curiosity seekers trespassed on military property, could they not have expected to be confronted, even arrested? At no time were we uh, trespassing the uh, military uh, area. We were well away from the military zone, and we were on public land. We had every right to be on public land, but yet we were harassed by this military helicopter dangerously. If this is true, if the military will even pursue civilians on public lands 10 miles away from the installation, haven't they overlooked the fact that this secret base is still easily visible from the air? Would it not be a simple matter to fly low over the complex and see exactly what kind of work is being done there? Retired Air Force Colonel Wendell Stevens doesn't think so. The airspace over the Nellis Range is highly restricted. Even military pilots on exercise here are forbidden to overfly this zone. If a pilot happens to stray into one of these restricted areas, it could mean the end of their career. If he continues to fly in this restricted area, he'll be ordered to leave immediately and will be given vectors to leave the area by the shortest route. If he doesn't respond, another airplane will be scrambled to intercept him and force him out of the area. If you as a civilian pilot were to fly into Groom Lake, certainly you can lose your pilot's license. Or he'll be shot down. For 40 years, it has been the location of choice uh, for testing black projects. Uh, the most secret projects in the world that our, our military is looking into, that's where they go. I mean, it's, lo it's perfect for that. Uh, it's uh, ringed by mountains. It's in the middle of nowhere. It has, uh, I'm told, surface-to-air missiles in case planes fly over that aren't welcome there. Uh, it has motion detectors in, in, in the ground. It has ammonia detectors that can sense the smell of ammonia in, in human skin. It has surveillance cameras to see wh who's looking down on the base. So it, it is uh, an extremely secure location. Of course, these kinds of security measures have been taken in the past around top secret military installations. Could it be the next generation of high-tech weaponry is currently being tested? Particle beams, high-powered lasers, or space weapons? Or could it be something else entirely? Many of us have devoted a lot of time and energy to research on what's going on at Area 51. But no question in my mind that a new type of technology is being developed. We have seen aircraft over there at Area 51 above the Groom Mountains that definitely resemble what's known as uh, flying disks or flying saucers. In the UFO research field, a growing number of experts are making claims that secret government projects at the Groom Lake facility are somehow related to technology brought here from another planet. Now, whether or not this incredible sounding claim is true, one thing seems very certain. Witnesses have seen some kind of aircraft at Groom Lake that appears to be nothing made by human designers. Have people actually seen UFOs around Area 51? What about photographs, videotapes, or film of these objects? Some amazing eyewitness reports when UFO Diaries return. 
hundreds of UFO watchers regularly drive out into the Nevada desert, across public land, and make their way up to the top of Whiteside Mountain or Freedom Ridge to try and catch a glimpse of what they believe to be a captured vehicle from another world. In one of our expeditions to Area 51, one of our members succeeded in taking a rather remarkable footage of what appears to be a disc-shaped object over Groom Lake itself. It didn't behave like any conventional aircraft I've ever seen. Uh, no sound whatsoever. But the remarkable thing is that in other occasions, uh, we have seen uh, the zigzag maneuvering of this uh, type of uh, aircraft, uh, sometimes uh, uh, almost a 75 degree turn and uh, sudden descension and ascension. Could this really be a vehicle from another planet that fell into human hands? A consistent story that comes up from a lot of workers is that a craft was brought here around 1953 and that actual live aliens were brought here about that same time. Well, the Russians have been taking pictures of Area 51 for, for many years. Stalin had an intense interest in UFOs, and one of the things he wanted to know about was Roswell. And the conclusion they came up with was something really did crash there, that it wasn't a weather balloon, and it wasn't anything of earthly origin. They didn't know exactly where it came from, but they knew it wasn't ours and it wasn't theirs, and this was something that uh, was of monumental importance that needed to be studied. Of course, these claims are still nothing more than hearsay and rumor without more evidence to support them. Does such proof exist? All the stories that float around this place are as much a mystery to workers as they are to us. Where exactly did these stories of captured UFOs at Area 51 originate? The folks who run Area 51 won't admit that it exists. Uh, there was a, a federal lawsuit that was just tossed out a, a few days ago in which they just wanted to know the name of the base. And, and they fought it tooth and nail and now don't have to reveal the name of it. If you work in a secret area like this, you come to work on jets from Las Vegas with the window shades down. Upon arrival at Groom Lake, you're, you're bussed in, in buses with blackout, blacked out windows directly to your workplace. You see nothing more than the hangar or the few buildings that you happen to work in. Uh, that's the interesting dichotomy. The Russians can fly over it and take pictures, but we, the people who put the bills for the place, aren't supposed to know about it. In 1988, a Russian satellite took a remarkable photograph over Area 51. Notice the object highlighted at the end of the runway. It's positioned at the same uh, position as if uh, it were about to take off. As unusual as the object in the photograph may be, it is hardly proof of a captured alien technology. Where is the real proof of these astounding claims? Bob Lazar paints a scenario where the, the craft has an anti-gravity reactor or a gravity reactor that, that produces a wave of gravity to counteract Earth's. If you're inside this craft, it has no seat belts because to you inside the craft, it is always upright at natural gravity. Could it be that the mysterious craft seen over Area 51 were not recovered at UFO crash sites? Is it possible that our government has been working secretly with an alien civilization? Are we on friendly terms with beings from another planetary system? The most startling revelations are yet to come when UFO Diaries returns. If true, Robert Lazar's claim that he worked on a full-scale flying version of this craft could well be the most important news story of the century. But what about the story behind this supposedly alien technology? How did it come to be in human hands? According to Lazar, during his stay at Area 51 and S4, he was given information which, if true, would constitute undeniable evidence of intelligent life on other planets. In Lazar's video interview, he claims that while at the super-secret S4 facility, he was shown official briefing documents stating that the beings who gave us the secrets of the flying saucer came from the Zeta Reticuli system, 35 light years from Earth. The beings are three to four feet tall and weigh 25 to 50 pounds. They have grayish skin and large heads with almond-shaped wraparound eyes. These beings said that they had been visiting Earth for a long time and presented photographic evidence which they contended was over 10,000 years old. There was an exchange of hardware and information in central Nevada until 1979, at which time there was a conflict which brought the program to an abrupt halt. Despite this supposed rift between humans and aliens, 
the beings from Zeta Reticuli allegedly left behind enough material for the scientists at S4 to piece together much of the technology for making a flying saucer fly. And presumably, it is that same flying saucer technology that is being routinely tested at Area 51. Is this the secret the military is so eager to protect at Area 51? Perhaps the tight security around the testing site is well warranted, because according to Lazar, this alien technology represents a force many times greater than our most powerful atomic bomb. Lazar says he witnessed the operation of the ship's power source and that it made use of the enormous energy made possible by antimatter. And according to Lazar, one matter-antimatter weapon could easily destroy all of human civilization. Lazar also claims that using this energy as a power source makes the craft impossible to detect. The disk can't be seen from any vantage point and for all practical purposes is invisible. All you could see would be the sky surrounding it. Assuming for a moment that all of this is true, what exact purpose could the military have in mind for this new technology? Norio Hayakawa says he believes these new advances will not be used for the common good of all humankind. You can rest assured that this technology, one way or the other, is going to be used for some type of military activity. This could be used for a large-scale, unprecedented type of war we have ever seen. According to Hayakawa, the secret installations at Area 51 and S4 are not the only places our government is experimenting with super-advanced technology. These are photos of a secret California facility uh, conducted by Lockheed Corporation. Uh, there are several secret air bases in Southern California where they are testing uh, the parts to build some of these uh, 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 this craft uh, objects. And uh, uh, the strange thing about these facilities is that uh, you don't see any aircraft on the runway, no aircraft whatsoever. When this facility was under construction, people in, near the, the area have seen rows and rows of cement trucks almost 24 hours a day for several weeks at a time. Uh, indicating that a large underground complex was being constructed. I was fortunate enough to interview people who constructed the underground facility at uh, Area 51. There's research laboratories and things like that under the desert floor, and then the, the surface was restored to look like it did before. According to Hayakawa, the security around this facility is as strict as that surrounding Area 51, and the sheer size of both facilities is truly staggering. Even if some secret project of gigantic proportions really is going underground in California and Nevada, does that mean the technology is being developed for hostile purposes? To be honest with you, I would not be surprised that some abductees are taken to some U.S. underground facilities. And if that is indeed the case, there again, we're dealing with a criminal case here that involves total violation of our constitutional system. Come on, come on. Can these stories actually be true? Have UFO abductees been brought by force to Area 51? Is there any evidence to support these frightening claims? In Robert Lazar's video, he claims that the S-4 facility near Area 51 is hidden inside a mountain in southern Nevada with nine giant hangar doors textured to blend in with the surroundings. Incredibly, this matches the description given by some people who claim to have been kidnapped by the occupants of a UFO and then taken to a mysterious underground facility. Abductees have been taken to places that they have assumed were underground facilities. Abductees have also reported that they have seen what appeared to be U.S. military people involved in their abduction. And yet, there are also those who believe that the military is developing this technology for the protection of the human race from an alien invasion. I don't think the government or the military believes that we face a major threat from anybody on this planet, that our greatest threat literally comes from someplace out of this world. Others believe the government is only interested in protecting itself, 
They started infiltrating UFO organizations. They spied on UFO researchers. They put out false information to muddy the waters. Uh, they actively encouraged this laughter curtain, uh, a policy of ridicule that anyone who sees a UFO is crazy. Well, anyone who sees a UFO is not crazy. Uh, that's just the, the prism through which we view this now. The government's done a very good job of, of uh, disinformation, of, of clouding the whole issue. Because of Russian satellite photos and other satellite photos of this area, we have absolutely no reason to doubt anymore that this facility exists. It's an underground military presence that is vast. Friends of mine who've been in it have said that it's literally a 40-story building buried underground. For whatever reason, the military continues its effort to gain control over the only two visual access areas to Groom Lake. The public demand for an explanation to the mystery of Area 51 is growing every day. If UFOs are real, the government has perhaps a legitimate interest in, in avoiding panic and, and making sure that society does not overreact to this situation. Uh, uh, purportedly, UFOs have been known to the government since the 40s and 50s. During that time, there was a lot of hysteria about communism, about world affairs. Uh, if you were to introduce UFOs at that time, perhaps there would be mass hysteria. Perhaps there would be a shaking of the foundations of our society.